in person very much um, today <laughs> at the building. So in the event of an emergency requiring that the building be evacuated, everyone will be asked to remain calm and take all your belongings and proceed to the nearest exit out of the building. A safety relocation point for the evacuation of the building is 1615 9th Street, which is Franklin D. Roosevelt Park. Please look for building staff holding up the second floor sign and everyone here would be encouraged to assemble at that relocation point um, with the building staff. Uh, if you need to use the restroom today during our meeting, the restrooms are right outside of those doors that you entered through and we have a staff person hanging out out there who will be able to let you back through the locked door. Um, if you want to sign on to the Wi-Fi, the um, network is CNRA guest and the password is March, all lowercase, 2024. So March 2024. Right now, I'm going to go over the procedures for members of the public who want to make a public comment during the meeting. So members of the public will be provided an opportunity to address the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee's Restoration Subcommittee on any of the agenda items that take place during today's meeting. If a member of the public is interested in providing public comment or asking a question on each of the agenda items, please raise your hand during the question and answer portion of the agenda item, or when the meeting facilitator asks if there are any public comments on that given agenda item. And then we will call on you um, and you will be asked to provide your comment. So if you're in person, you can raise your actual hand. And if you're on Zoom, um, we ask that you use the raise hand feature, which is available when you click on the reactions button in the Zoom webinar control bar. And this will indicate that you'd like to provide a comment. When called on by the meeting facilitator, you can then, you will be given the ability to unmute yourself on Zoom and you can provide your verbal comment or question at that time. And we ask that when you're done commenting to please lower your hand. Lastly, if you are participating via the telephone, you can dial star nine and that will raise your hand in the Zoom meeting. And then to lower your hand, you will dial star nine again. Um, but similarly to the previous, you'll be asked, you'll be allowed to unmute yourself and asked to give your comment verbally. All right, lastly, for in-person attendees, as I said, you can raise your hand. Um, and you will be able to provide comment either during the Q&A or during, during the public comment portion of each agenda item. And when you're called on by the meeting facilitator, um, there are microphones. There's those little black discs that are sitting around the room. So they should pick us all up pretty well. Um, so you can just state your comment verbally, your question or comment verbally. Um, and the facilitators will do our best to repeat the comments since we're sitting close to the mic over here so that everyone is able to hear it on Zoom. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions and provide public comment during each of the agenda items. And then we do have a last agenda item that is general public comment. And this is a period for comments on matters that are not on our agenda today, but are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Restoration Subcommittee. So that's all on how to give public comment. If you need help making a public comment or if you encounter any sort of technical issues, we do have some alternative ways to provide public comment. You can email engage at deltacouncil.ca.gov or you can call or text 916-902-6459 and someone will help you in making your public comment. The Delta Restoration Subcommittee will be providing subcommittee members, participants, and members of the public the opportunity to participate in this meeting via teleconference, and that is pursuant to government code section 11123.5. Thank you very much. Um, next slide, please. Next slide again, please. Excellent. Um, so first, just a brief overview of today's agenda. First, we're gonna be doing some welcome introductions and announcements. Um, we'll be doing our roll call, um, having some introductions of our members, and then if time allows, just introductions of the folks that are um, participating in the meeting today. And then we have three other major agenda items, including a presentation on invasive aquatic education entitled Wetland Restoration Project, a recap of the Delta to entitled Wetland Restoration Symposium and a recap from the November Delta Restoration Forum. And we'll close out with that general public comment period that we discussed previously. Excellent. 
So now that we have covered that, we are going to, um, next slide please, uh, provide some introductions um, and we're gonna do that through our subcommittee roll call. So if you are your agency's representative on the subcommittee today, Elizabeth is going to be calling the agency names. And so when that your agency name is called, if you're the representative on the subcommittee, please state your name, affiliation, and title. Um, and that'll be you sort of reading yourself into the roll call. And this is also going to be your chance to share any relevant announcements that you have um, on behalf of your agency. So if you have any announcements on behalf of your agency you want to give, you can give them at this time. So I'll turn it over to Elizabeth now to read out the agency names and we'll do our roll call. Okay, and also we had a couple of members who said they were participating remotely. And so for, for those couple of people, we're gonna do all the people, um, all the agencies in person first and I'll do the two remote members at the end. So I may call those couple of agencies for the remote members, but hang on until, if you're not in person, hang on till the end. So it's a little confusing, but it's the hybrid, uh, hybrid situation. All right, so for those in person, and I'm gonna do this by agency, um, Delta Stewardship Council. Yeah. Good afternoon, Jeff Henderson, Deputy Executive Officer for Planning at the Delta Stewardship Council. And is also here today. My main announcement is that we recently, as in like the last two or three days, posted updates to our performance measures, including updated um, tracking information associated with the performance measures that were adopted as part of the 2022 Geneva system. So that's, that's the two updates. Okay, and the whole special system planning and science. Um, the main updates um, there, um, you know, this is one of the subcommittees for the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee. The second one is the Delta Agency Science Work Group. Some of you may also be aware of that one and maybe on those, those emails as well. That group is meeting on March 19th and we'll be focusing on harmful algal blooms. So if you're not on that list and are curious, please reach out. Happy to send you an invite to that. And then the full detail will be gathering on April 15th. Okay. Um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. California Department of Food and Agriculture. Oh, sorry. Dan Ellis, Senior National Scientist with Energy Services. California Department of Food and Agriculture. I'm Patricia Bolt. I'm a Senior Environmental Scientist Specialist and the Biodiversity Coordinator, the Office of Environmental Farming and Innovation for CBFA. Um, California Department of Water Resources. So many with cream scrubs. Charlotte draws the first. Hi, Charlotte Big. Water Resources. I don't have any. That's fine. Uh, California Natural Resources Agency. California EPA, Central Valley Flood Protection Board. Good afternoon, everybody. Jamie Silva, Senior Environmental Scientist with the Environmental Services and Land Management Branch. Uh, no, that's uh, Delta Protection Commission, um, Delta Conservancy. Hello, um, Dan Blingram, Executive Officer, Delta Conservancy. Um, our big announcement is that we were just been very successful in moving the nature-based solutions funding that we received to 11 projects that will convert agricultural lands on the deeply subsided areas in the Delta to either rice or managed wetland. Should result in about 110,000 tons per year of avoided carbon emissions and stopping subsidence on 11,000 acres. Um, actually just signed the grant agreement yesterday for restoring, restoring all of web tract um, to a mosaic of rice and managed wetland to demonstrate how we can manage these islands in perpetuity uh, and more resilient, uh, stop subsidence, stop carbon emissions, and also economically viable in the future. So really excited about that. Okay. Um, State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, NOAA Fisheries. 
I'm Amanda Cranford. Uh, I work for the No Fisheries Central Valley Office in Sacramento. Uh, I'm our lead for collaborative science and adaptive management. Um, and I'm sitting in for Kathy Marsikevich today. Unfortunately, she wants to make this naked. Um, one quick announcement that I think will be of interest. Uh, on February 2nd, we released our five-year status review for Sacramento River winter ruction of salmon. So uh, just quick note on the conclusion. Um, we've determined they should remain in danger, but uh, just a note for this group, uh, certainly one of the um, uh, changes in the positive direction over you know the last six or plus years is the amount of habitat restoration benefiting the species. Unfortunately, some of the other limiting factors didn't, you know, um, turn the dial in, in a direction that we could downlist them, but um, that's, I think, interested, uh, interesting information for folks who are conducting restoration out there on the landscape. Thank you. Okay, um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. You might have person line will get to him. No one person. Um, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. U.S. Department of the Interior. Uh, U.S. EPA. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sarai Cohen. I'm the Wetland and Ocean Sector Manager at EP Region 9. And uh, with me, I have Fadwa Yeah, hi everyone. Fadwa Pujara, scientist also at the Wetlands and Ocean Sector, primarily focusing on the Delta San Joaquin region. Okay. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, again, probably online. U.S. Geological Survey. Okay, and we have a couple non DPIC agencies who do participate on the subcommittee, so I'll call them now in case they're in person. State Parks Division of Voting and Waterways. So, my name is Jeffrey Caudell, and I'm the program supervisor for the Aquatic Based Plant Control Program. No announcements. Standing in for Eddie Hart today. And Buena Vista Rancheria. Okay, and now for the members who are participating remotely, we had two people who um, provided notice that they were going to do that. So. I'll call their names now, and are they able to unmute themselves to? Oh, okay, and you will be unmuted so that you can um, state your name and title and give us any announcements. So first, Kaylee Allen, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Hi, I'm Kaylee Allen. I am the Senior Advisor for Resources with the Pacific Southwest region of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I don't have any announcements today. Thanks. And Michael Porter, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Okay, that is that is our list. Um, thanks very much. Uh, quickly, Kaylee, um, can you please disclose if you have anyone over the age eighteen um, in this room with you at this time? I do not. Thank you very much. All right, um, thank you all for those announcements and those roll call introductions. Um, I think in the interest of time, we probably won't go around the room and do introductions, but I think most people that are here are either gonna be speaking and will get a chance to introduce themselves. And if you fall into the like smaller group of folks that aren't speaking and haven't, make sure that you just, um, you know, we encourage everybody to interact and um, introduce themselves to each other at any given time. All right, thank you very much. Next slide, please. All right, so a quick moment here um, to refresh on the purpose of the DPIC Restoration Subcommittee. So this subcommittee was formed in an effort to identify and implement strategies to reduce the barriers to restoration across the Delta and Sassoon Marsh landscape in order to increase estuary-wide coordination. So in order to meet some of our restoration targets, we wanted to bring a group together um, just really try to you know, overcome some of the barriers that make restoration more difficult in our region. Next slide, please. And we try to meet this purpose through a few different avenues, one of which is subcommittees. Um, and that is like what we're talking about today. Um, we have task forces. Um, and an example of that are the planning group that helped to put together the restoration forum. Um, and then we try to provide a regular forum that welcomes stakeholders to participate in restoration coordination. And so that's why, you know, I invite folks to introduce themselves to each other try to make some cross-sectoral connections. And then we also have our broader restoration forum, which is a more formal place uh, where we try to bring together lots of different folks that are interested and invested in restoration in the Delta and Sassoon March. Next slide, please. 
All right, so I think that's it for our introductions and welcomes. Thanks so much for your all's attention. And I'm gonna hand it over to Dylan Chapel now to lead the next agenda item. Great, thanks. Um, for those of you I don't know, um, I'm Dylan Chapel, Environmental Program Manager of the Adaptive Management Unit um, at the Delta Stewardship Council and co-lead um, on the DPIP Restoration Subcommittee. So um, we are excited to bring this agenda item to you today. Um, and before we get into it, I just, want to um, briefly introduce uh, the panel that we'll have for our discussion. Um, so to my left, we have Louise Conrad, who's the lead scientist of the Department of Water Resources, California Department of Water Resources. Um, Gina Darren is a senior environmental scientist supervisor at the Department of Water Resources uh, in the Fish Restoration Program. And Jeff Caudill, senior environmental scientist um, supervisor from the California State Parks Division of Boating and Waterways. Um, and then um, also just want to acknowledge the other uh, contributors on this slide who have, um, who have helped us develop the work that we're going to be presenting to you all today. Um, and I'm particularly um, interested in, uh, you know, we're particularly excited to bring this agenda item to you because it's actually a follow up on some work that um, this group presented to the full DPIC, uh, almost deep maybe even to the day four years ago. <laughs> so just before uh, we all went remote, um, we were uh, over in the library a few blocks from here discussing this very issue. So we're excited to bring some of these updates to you. So before we dive into the details, um, uh, I did just want to frame up these discussion questions that were also included in our meeting notice to help us set the stage um, for what we're hoping that you all can consider alongside our panelists as we walk through this presentation. So. Um, these are the discussion topics we're going to come back to at the end. So possible approaches for expanding and permitting adaptive management of invasive aquatic vegetation control in or near restoration sites. Possible approaches to better integrate invasive aquatic vegetation monitoring and control actions into the restoration planning and permitting process. And how agencies and interested parties might support ongoing adaptive management for invasive aquatic vegetation control. So you're probably picking up on the themes of our presentation pretty clearly from these discussion items. Um, and we are looking forward to diving in in more detail. Um, just wanted to briefly mention why we're bringing this item to you in particular. Um, and, uh, you know, the DPIC Restoration Subcommittee is really focused on the restoration um, aspects of the Delta Plan. So um, this particularly relates to Chapter 4 of the Delta Plan, um, including our ecosystem restoration policies around avoiding introductions of and habitat improvements for invasive non-native species, um, prioritizing and implementing actions to control non-native invasive species, uh, establishing program level endangered species permitting mechanisms that increase efficiency for ecosystem restoration actions. And so these are the main links to the Delta plan um, related to this agenda item today. Um, and, but of course, this is a big topic, not just in the Delta, but throughout California and across initiatives. And so um, this also relates, for example, to the um, Delta Science Action Agenda Action 5A, as well as other state and federal initiatives, including endangered species um, recovery plans, um, the California Water Resilience Portfolio, and the 30 by 30 efforts. Um, as far as drilling down into how this item specifically relates to our restoration subcommittee work plan, um, we have a few specific objectives, uh, first being identifying regulatory challenges to restoration and potential solutions to, to these challenges, something we'll be talking about today. Identifying efficiencies and areas for improved collaboration and long-term management of restoration lands. And lastly, identifying mechanisms for ev evaluating the effectiveness of restoration and opportunities for better implementing long-term adaptive management, monitoring, and synthesis. And as you'll hear today, um, the control of invasive non-native species is really, it is restoration. It's a critical part of the restoration process, um, particularly for our tidal wetlands here in the system. Um, another direct link to the Delta plan um, is to the adaptive management requirements. Um, so uh, some of you may be familiar uh, that the Delta plan requires adaptive management for both ecosystem restoration as well as water management projects. Um, and some of the themes that we're going to be hitting on today um, are really directly related to what you need in order to effectively implement adaptive management. So we're going to be hearing a bit about pilot studies. We're going to be hearing about how monitoring and data has helped us improve our understanding as well as active management techniques. 
Um, we're going to hear about the evaluation and synthesis that's helped us elucidate some of these complex interactions across the system um, and the ability of programs to take this information and change with um, uh, and effectively adapt and change their, um, their processes. Uh, this all exists um, in the context of the need for regulatory and permitting flexibility to be able to move um, new approaches forward. And then, of course, um, and, you know, I think the broader subcommittee, as well as our panel, um, speaking to the importance of collaboration and coordination between entities. This, there's a lot of different folks who are involved to make this happen. Uh, really complex, really large scale. That's what we're talking about here. So some things to keep in mind, some themes that will come up here. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Louise Conrad. Right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here and thanks for taking the time to talk about this very important issue. Um, well, as, as uh, Dylan just stated, this is part of restoration is, and, and, and adaptive management is minding the invasive species and specifically we're talking about the aquatic plants. And I wanna highlight with this slide, the level of investment that the state is, is undertaking for restoration. So there are, um, Charlotte can speak to this um, for firsthand, um, as well as Gina will too in a moment, over 30,000 acres of restoration occurring in the Delta of various different types, um, but, but 9,000 of those acres roughly on tidal, tidal wetland restoration. And that's where there's a real vulnerability to invasion um, and that is already happening in many sites, and we'll have some slides on that, um, of, of invasive aquatic vegetation. So next slide. So looking back to the white paper that Dylan already mentioned, it was literally the brink of going to all in person. And so the, the experience of presenting to the full DPIC is is one of the last things I did before going to uh, going to remote work. And it's for that reason, partly in, ingrained in my mind, but also quite a bit of collaborative work that went into the production of this paper. That's what, uh, 20 pages or so, where we looked into the risks um, and the links to adaptive management and made some recommendations for what really needed to happen to advance science and advance our ability to manage invasive aquatic vegetation as it encroaches on restoration sites. And so one of those was that we wanted to be, we needed to be more proactive. That includes the with a real emphasis on the paper we had to the importance of innovation and science to getting to tools that can be effective. At the time, and I think Jeff is gonna to speak to this a little bit more, we were on the tail end of um, a major research project and there's been several now that have shown that some of the tools, especially for submerged aquatic vegetation, are limited in their ability to be effective in the Delta simply because it is a tidal system. And so when you are applying tools where you need say a specific concentration of herbicide that you need to maintain, sometimes for long periods of time, in order to have any effect on the plants that you're trying to treat, it's really hard to do that in a tidal system and at the scale of the restoration sites that, that we're trying to maintain and will construct and maintain. Uh, we noted in the paper as well that we needed to identify funding for consistent monitoring to for, for aquatic weed coverage. And that's important not only for uh, maintaining some idea of what the status and trends are, but also for early detection. So we know that if you can detect invasive species early on, then you're gonna be more likely to treat the issue. Um, and I already talked a little bit about the new tools. I did wanna highlight that, you know, in addition to the need for innovation and science in this area, it's also a policy issue. And that's because um, Division of Boating and Waterways and any entity treating aquatic habitat in the Delta needs a permit. And to do, um, to operate and to go, go forward with innovation or try new ideas needs to be permitted. Um, and if there is not flexibility around that, and, and I mean, we need to have all the permits be science-based and, um, and important guardrails for the safety of using chemicals to say in the habitat, um, there needs to be the ability to to try tools to see what they will work and then be able to um, evaluate the trade-offs between using certain tools and, and, and if they're effective to having vegetation in place that could be invasive and, and undermine the benefits that we're trying to achieve with the restoration habitat. 
Um, next slide. Okay, so with this slide, I wanna note for those of you that aren't aware, there are multiple forms of invasive aquatic vegetation in the Delta. They are three general types, floating aquatic vegetation, floats on the water surface, um, submerged aquatic vegetation is rooted and it's full, the full organism of the plant is submerged under the water. And then emergent aquatic vegetation is, has its roots in tidal uh, aquatic wetted habitat, but is existing above, above entirely, the, the foliage is entirely above the, the water and is and a little bit more upland compared to floating aquatic vegetation. So what I wanna note about each of these three general communities of aquatic vegetation is that they are all dominated in the Delta by invasive species. And that list of invasive species is one that is not static, it is changing. The um, species in bold there are relatively recent invaders and uh, are now uh, expanding in, in the Delta. And, and each of these is gonna have different tools that are gonna be most effective. So not only is there a need to be innovating and trying to figure out how to treat the system that we have in the Delta, which is tidal, we also have a moving target in, in terms of the, what our targets are for, for treatment. So it's a very difficult problem. Um, next slide. Uh, okay, so this, this and the next slide are going to talk a little bit more about the expansion and really underscore the issue that in that map, this is a kind of the map I just showed about the scale of restoration. The, the expansion is happening right in the area where we are trying to provide restoration um, benefits. So between 2004 and 2018, submerged aquatic vegetation coverage more than doubled in the North and Central Delta, and, and specifically in these areas of the um, North Delta Arc, Liber Liberty Island area, where we're seeing quite a bit of expansion. And I think the next slide will show that. Thank you. So uh, here you're seeing um, an imagery that's taken uh, from the air, and then that imagery is being classified uh, by the type of vegetation that's occupying that space. So the blue is open water. Um, and what you can see in this time series from of the same spot from between 2004 and October 2016 is a general theme of expansion. So you can see this is gonna be occupying the very habitat where we're hoping to provide space for our native fishes. Um, but also, this uh, Ludwigia is water primrose. It's a floating species, but also has the ability to encroach upon the land. So it's not only affecting the water surface, but also some of our native plants like uh, tulis. Gina will talk about that more in a moment. Um, I want to note before we move on to the next slide that one of the things that we've identified um, as an important science action is to understand the thresholds at which we really need to be able to provide control in order to maintain benefits of restoration for at these sites. So we know that it has a negative impact and we know that, and I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide, but um, to, we know also that to the extent the invasion, invasion has already occurred in some of these places, Jeff will probably be the first one to tell you we're not going to full eradication. It's not likely to happen, but we need to develop targets for where we need to achieve control. And at what, at what level do we need to maintain the amount of spread so that we still see the benefits we're trying to achieve? Um, next slide. So it's so a little bit more on the impacts to the listed fish species, specifically delta smelt and a juvenile and, and listed species of salmonids that are are protected species. So we know that invasive aquatic vegetation can decrease dissolved oxygen, increase water temperature, slow water velocity, and reduce turbidity. And this affects the habitat. And in some cases, like for turbidity for delta smelt, that's a direct impact on their ability to feed in some cases. So um, this is changing food web pathways as well. Water movement is going to change in and out of these areas because some of these infestations are so thick that um, you might, if you're in the field, sometimes even see birds walking uh, upon them um, in, at low tide. Uh, submerged aquatic vegetation and floating aquatic vegetation can create habitat for non-native fishes that then become predators or are eating the same things that our listed fish species are trying to eat. So they are also com competitors. 
And then I wanna note that this is again at the grand scale, um, many thousands of acres um, that we are trying to achieve for mitigation for the state water project, but also for other efforts um, in moving forward into the future. And it really is going to undermine this effectiveness. And we are right in the middle of this construction of this tidal wetland habitat, that 8,400 acres that Gina is going to talk about now. Thanks, Luis. All right, so I'm Darren, the Senior Environmental Scientist in the Fish Restoration Program. And I am super excited. I have the great privilege of working with the team who does the actual on the ground work to restore these habitats. And from what my team and I have seen on the ground, I can't uh, emphasize this enough, invasive aquatic vegetation management is tidal habitat restoration. Uh, so for example, the pictures on the slides here are pictures of their, the tall or upright plants or tulis, the mix of desired tulis species and cattails, these provide uh, a diversity in the vegetation community, which is really good for all the species that live on the sites, not just the fish. And you can see in the foreground of all the pictures, it's either a invasive water primrose or water hyacinth that is coming in and covering up the open water habitat, and in some cases, growing up and over the two leaves. So they're really filling in every niche and they're um, out competing because they don't have their own predators uh, here they are out competing the desirable native vegetation for resources, light nutrients, um, and uh, the native vegetation tend to have natural herbivores and uh, diseases that keep them in check and the invaders do not. So they have um, better ability to compete and what we're trying to do is rebalance so that the natives uh, can compete with these invasive species. So yes, they are spreading into restoration sites um, the issue, it, while, so the second bullet there, while restoration projects are designed for the listed species, for the salmonids, for the delta smelt, invasive aquatic veg control is restricted. It is often herbicide use or it is a very um, destructive mechanical harvester or um, disturbing the ground backhoes. Uh, this control effort is often restricted by concern for those same species because it, the control is happening in critical endangered species habitat. And so there's a lot of scrutiny on it for that reason, which is good, but it's a, it's a barrier. So the risk of doing nothing, of not managing aquatic invasive vegetation is, is very, very high. So the next two bullets there are the risks. The big risks are you have reduced ecological function of your site of your restoration site uh, for not only the list of fish species we're trying to protect, but I would argue all the species that use the site. The other big risk is your risk of losing your investment. I mean, I don't have the numbers on, on hand, but millions and millions of dollars go into designing and implementing these restoration sites. And so that, that it, you cannot breach a levee and walk away and hope that the restoration site is gonna function on its own. We have to be actively managing them. And the other potential risk of impacts of invasive aquatic veg to restoration sites is risk of not getting or losing mitigation credits to operate the state water project. All right, uh, so Luis described the impacts to listed invasive listed fish, and I advocate that invasive veg is bad for all the species. It takes active management and relatively, invasive aquatic veg management, relative is bang for the buck is great as compared mm -hmm. to say, re-breaching a levee or re-engineering channels once the, they've silted in because of uh, invasive veg settling out all your, your sediment. So I will advocate that this is uh, an opportunity to actively and adaptively manage our restoration sites that's relatively easy uh, if we can just get out of our own way. So I do appreciate that there is scrutiny to large scale herbicide use. Absolutely appreciate that. Uh, however, the delays in getting the use of herbicides permitted at scale for restoration sites are 
costly because while we're waiting for our permits and to get all the information, uh, the invasive species are spreading and we will need now more herbicide to manage what we could have caught early. Uh, next slide. Speaking of pilot studies, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Blacklock. So that first map in the first slide that Dylan presented had, uh, it looked like it had a picture of a wetland and it had little colorful dots all over it. So those colorful dots were our treatment plots where we studied different treatments, uh, integrated pest management treatments. So herbicides, different herbicides, mixes of herbicides and mowing in different spots, big plots, 10 by 10 meters. That's actually really big. Um, and to looking at the effectiveness of uh, managing invasive phragmites in a tidal wetland in critical endangered species habitat, the Black Lock was the very first tidal wetland habitat uh, restoration site in Sisu Marsh. And then we we're not only looking at an effective control treatment, because we actually know how to control phragmites. The question is, what are the off-target impacts to food web, to non-target plants, and to that are important. <laughs> Cont uh, contaminants, water quality. Thank you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, you think you don't forget these things. Um, <clears throat> All right, so this is a pilot study that we got funded by the Delft Conservancy work with UC Davis, uh, and it was an interagency collaboration. Uh, the Black Lock site, while not a fish restoration program site, is adjacent to two very large, very expensive fish restoration program restoration sites, Bradmore and Arnold. Uh, and it is, Black Lock is absolutely full of, of fragments. So this is a picture of something I noticed while I was out there one day with my team. And you'll see on the right side of this photo, the tall skinny plants, dark green, are the tulies. And uh, sunlight can get through to the mud uh, under tulies. There's a diverse assemblage of different species in there. There's little spike brushes, um, other things, and uh, Mason zoliopsis, which is a rare uh, California listed rare plant. Phragmites is the bushy, leafy plant on the left side. And I noticed in this particular spot, that there was Mason's Iliopsis carpeting the mud flat under the tulies. And then this Phragmites started moving in over time. And those yellow circles are probably where Mason's Iliopsis was, and it is now complete, probably shaded out. I'll have to go back to the spot. But that's what we're seeing is that the leafy structure of Phragmites is shading out and then it's dominating you know, all other species. So uh, we conducted a three year study and concluded that. We have effective tools to manage phragmites, and there are not any off-target adverse effects from those tools, measurably so. So the goal, and I'm going to say it before you let Jeff say it, we're not going to eradicate phragmites. I know that. Uh, but what we want to do is knock it back so that it is now one of the members of a diverse assemblage of vegetation on a restoration site. And there are benefits to phragmites. I will, I will say it as much as I hate to admit it. <laughs> uh, there are benefits. Uh, recent, two very recent studies. One is not even impressed yet. We've got to talk about it. Uh, there's a lot more native frag out there in that study is showing than, than invasive. But if it's acting like this to me and it's interrupting our goals of a restoration site, I'm going to treat it like an invasive. The other uh, study that came out recently is that Phragmites, with its leafy shady structure, is providing temperature refugia for critters in week-long, 100-plus degree day heat waves. So, while we're not going to get rid of all of it, we're going to leave some of it for um, climate change reasons because we can't get rid of all of it. Yeah. All right. So ra rather than eradication being the goal, I agree we need to figure out thresholds. So that's definitely something we need a lot of brains to come together to help us figure out what is an appropriate threshold um, to maintain a healthy diversity in a community to benefit all the species. And so my experiences with emergent aquatic vegetation like Phragmites Jeff's experiences with floating and submerged aquatic veg. So I'll let Jeff explain that side of things. Thank you, Gina. Well, thank you to the subcommittee, the folks in the room, and the folks online for giving me the opportunity to talk about our program a little bit today. So Jeffrey Cardell, California State Parks, and I uh, am the supervisor for the Aquatic and Plant Control Program. Our program is mandated uh, to the Harvest Navigation Code 60.64.5 to control aquatic disciplines in the Delta to support and to help, to help protect the environment, the economy, and the public health. And so with all the regulatory permits that have briefly been mentioned earlier today that we have, it allows our program to control up to 15,000 acres of aquatic vegetation in the California Delta. 
for reference, that area in terms of water acres is about 68,000 acres right now. Uh, also, we talk about the species. There are 10 current species that we have on our target list on the basic aquatic vegetation. Four of them are floating plants, and six of them are submerged plants. Uh, our current budget right now is $5.3 million per year. And so when it comes to me giving you the hat trick on eradication now, which is the third time I've mentioned it, uh, we don't have the funding to be able to provide for eradication of plant species in the Delta. On top of it, we don't have control over the inputs into the Delta. We are limited in a geographic space, do the best we can with the limited resources we have, and to manage all the different expectations of all the stakeholders that we have within the Delta. Next slide. So as a part of all the regulatory actions that have been taken at the legislature, it used to be that California Congress would authorize a plant, and then a plant, and then a plant could control uh, in Delta for our program of the agency. And in 2013, Assembly Bill 763 had allowed us to work with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife on a risk assessment process where CDFW would utilize their partners and their subject matter experts to make a determination on a risk assessment should another plant be added. And as a result of that, we now have 10 plants instead of the three we had going into this process. And as uh, Dr. Lewis Conrad had pointed out earlier, alligator weed and ribbon weed are the two most recent plants that have been added in 2018 and 2022, respectively, to our program list. So that list is going to grow. It is unfortunately not going to shrink. On top of it, we have worked with U.S. Uh, Federal Services, which is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Marine Fishery Services on uh, our biological opinions, which are the federal authorizations that our program has to operate. And in doing so, we have worked with them on an annual basis on some of our newer control tools that have proved to be more effective, but have potential impacts towards critical habitat of the listed species to try and get new tools uh, for our program. And we have had some success with that that we'll talk about very briefly in a moment. On top of it, we found that Increased communication with other state agencies, such as the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, or CDFW on these risk assessments, allows that time frame to be shortened. You just jump in there with a, an emergency request without any kind of uh, previous or prior notifications. It doesn't necessarily speed up this process because they have a lot of work to do to deem the product, or a uh, plant, excuse me, to be invasive. Uh, next slide, please. And so, with all the permitting that we have, this is what we might refer to as the trivial pursuit wheel of regulatory authorizations that our program needs to, offer, uh, to work with. And these are both the regulatory agencies and in many ways our partners that we work with to be able to control aquatic vegetation because there are endangered species within the program area, which makes it very challenging. But there are also, there are also opportunities as uh, the reason why we're here to talk about restoration and what I'll end my invite you to the talk with. And so we work with a lot of different local, state, and federal agencies on uh, making sure that we are compliant, have the correct conservation and mitigation measures, but are also working with them as our partners to be able to accomplish our mission and our goals and see if there's any synergy within our goals. That's a part of the reason why uh, our, our program has worked with uh, CDFW and then are in the past to be able to expand our program to find missions that we can synergize with so one of the things that I'll also mention is that demonstration investigation zones are something that our program came up with and as a part of our biological opinions. It is the new use of a tool that we have not utilized before. We are going to have it in our committed plot. We are going to write essentially a small white paper on it to take a lot of data and work with the federal agencies to make sure that we all understand the use, effectiveness, but the also potential impacts of this tool. Be able to use, utilize this tool operationally within the parameters of our biological opinions and authorizations. Uh, next slide, please. And so, as far as the controls, we have started this, this process back in 2019, and as a result, we have a few new tools that we have as operational. One, for example, is drones. We can use drones uh, as a, an application tool with the current herbicides that we have. On top of it, we have two different Contact uh, herbicides for some rest aquatic vegetation compared to the systemic herbicide that we used to use before. The challenge with the systemic herbicide, chlorodone, is that it is effective in static waters, but the delta is unfortunately not a static waterway. And to be able to keep those concentrations in the water at an effective level is very, very costly and resource intensive. These contact herbicides that we're using now instead have a lot of great benefits, including it's easier on the resource cost, it's more effective, and it's contact, which makes it work faster. 
But the downside to that is it has potential impacts to the endangered fish in the area and the critical habitat. So we have to be very careful with that. We are promoting adaptive management. As I mentioned, we're kind of reducing those for our uh, Florida. But with these new contact herbicides, the benefits of it could be very, very good in a restoration setting where having a monoculture of basically in the area that you are trying to restore for kind of wetland acres doesn't give you the restorative benefits that you're hoping for. And on top of it, it's not very good for the endangered species or the critical habitat that are there. Some of the challenges that we have with this program, too, are we have found ways to work with the federal agencies and state agencies and our partners to be able to find new control tools that work for the rest of the system. But when it comes to working with the restoration areas, which is key habitat for endangered fish is endangered species and critical habitat, the science is really what helps drive us forward. The work that we've done with DWR in the Interagency Ecological Program in the past helped us take a step into helping and working with these restoration sites. But unfortunately, with these new tools, while they may be effective, uh, we don't have the science to really allow us to engage fully within these restoration sites so that we can help maintain and control the aquatic the invasive vegetation of these sites. And that's something that is kind of an ongoing dire need, at least with our program, to be able to work with these other restoration agencies. Next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned, with the challenges, there's a lot of stakeholders in the Delta. They all have different needs. But while we do use herbicides as our main control tool, because of the resource limitation that we have, along with the vast amount of area that is under our jurisdiction, uh, recovering when it comes to controlling aquatic vegetation. Our goal has been to work smarter and not harder. We aim for more effective tools. We may aim for uh, better monitoring tools to be able to go from waiting for complaints on the phone or pictures to be sent to our email addresses versus us having to drive out there and cover 68,000 acres of growth to using NASA satellite imagery, other remote sensing data that may be available, and to try and increase our ability to know what's going on, find the trends, be more effective in our program. And as much as I wish we had some kind of early detection or rapid response, uh, challenges with the regulatory permits, these agencies move slow for a reason. There's a lot of work that they have to do. And it prevents us from being able to say work towards eradication. So, unfortunately, besides resource constraints, there's also just time on the stretch of the agencies. Um, and so, I think that's it for me. And then we'll move on to uh, Dylan. Yeah, great. So, um, just want to thank our panelists for helping flesh out this really complex topic here. Um, just putting this slide back up one more time um, to, you know, highlight some of the themes that we heard. So, um, you know, we heard about um, the work going on with uh, regards to Phragmites and Sassoon Marsh, those pilot studies that now have established the base of science that allow us to move forward with some of that control. Um, uh, if, you know, if those pathways are available, um, this, this, critical role of monitoring and data. Um, just want to underscore that those insights from the 2020 white paper were um, from a really extensive report. I don't know how many pages that report is, but it's a, it's, it's a long, <laughs> long, larger report um, that really took a close look at tools like Floridone to say, what is the efficacy? Um, uh, answering these questions wasn't necessarily built in. And so that importance of, um, on Jeff's last slide, he mentioned effectiveness monitoring which um, is, happens in contrast to compliance monitoring. So Jeff's team, for example, does a lot of compliance monitoring on, around water quality, but the effectiveness monitoring um, and then subsequent analysis is what we really need to move adaptive management forward. And that's beyond often what's covered um, in baseline funding. So um, I think we've also seen across all of these examples, the ability to change with new information. Um, Four years ago, when we gave this initial presentation, we were in a much different place with these issues. We've come a long way, but um, you know, we really want to stress that this is ongoing. If you think back to that slide that Louise put up of, you know, uh, maybe about a dozen different invaders, each of those invaders, you know, requires different tools, <laughs> becomes prolific in different areas, and each of those different settings um, requires information to understand what's actually happening with treatment. And so we expect this to really be an ongoing issue. Um, this isn't one that we're going to solve per se, 
but we are, um, I think, really establishing a great baseline for working together to continue to address new issues as they come up in a more and more coordinated way over time. So um, with that, I'll bring us back to the questions that we started with, um, these, these sort of general discussion topics. Um, I'm gonna start by opening these up to our panel. Um, and once our panel has had a chance to, um, to provide some of their sort of initial responses, then we'll open it up uh, to folks in the room, uh, and then we'll open it up to folks online, uh, and then close with uh, this, this agenda item with a general public comment. So, um, so I'd like to just uh, invite any of our panelists to uh, pick wherever you'd like to start here, starting with, with number one would be appropriate, but um, uh, we can open up um, discussions around any of these topics. <laughs> All right, so uh, Gina Dan, Fish Restoration Program. So the possible approaches, number one, for expanding and permitting adaptive management for invasive aquatic veg in or near restoration sites. Um, so one of the one of the issues that I was was presented to me many many years ago was when we, they started uh, land managers started seeing Phragmites expanding in in Sisu Marsh. What could we do about it? And I was like, nothing. It's in critical endangered species habitat. Uh, it's not on voting waterways treatment list. It's, um, we cannot, there's really no way to control Phragmites other than with systemic herbicides. So it's a, it's a non-starter and they were just watching it happen. And then we went to uh, our permitting agencies to say, hey, now we've got restoration sites in the area. We really need to deal with this. And they said, we don't have enough information to know if it's safe to do so in critical endangered species habitat. So, um, my boss said, get a grant. All right. So we went to the Delta Conservancy. Thank you. And uh, partnered with agencies uh, to investigate this question. Uh, so that the purpose of that study was to get information for the permitting agencies to feel uh, like they had enough now to be able to permit the adaptive management at scale. So they were fine with 10 by 10 meter plots, but now we're talking 30 acres of Phragmites needs treatment. Um, and we presented a, a path forward at scale in a phased approach similar to the San Francisco Invasive Spartina project. So there's endangered species, especially the copper rail. And so what they do is they phase their treatment so that the endangered species in the area who are using the target invader can move out. So we have that same approach. We're gonna do uh, black block in three phases um, in thirds and to give any salt marsh harvest mouse, rails, fish, any uh, chance to get out. Um, and so it has now been two years since we submitted our, our applications uh, to scale up. Uh, we got the last of the information from the study in 2021. And we're really hoping that this is the year. But um, my, my my request is that everyone here understand how important it is to do this work and that delays, again, are very costly. And if your agency needs information in order to permit adaptive management, please let us know more what information you want. <laughs> so when we design very expensive, very long-term studies to get it, we're getting the right information. So that would, yeah, that's something I thought of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you, Gina. I wanted to speak a little bit to the early detection rapid response piece. Um, it's not really one of the things but we'll put it in number two is um, related to monitoring. And one of the things that uh, some, this, there's a couple of interagency groups that talk about invasive aquatic vegetation and have collaborative venues for discussion, which has been a really helpful thing. And actually right now, the invasive aquatic vegetation project work team of the interagency ecological program is meeting, having great conversations as we speak over here. Um, one of the things that that group has suggested could happen is proactive risk assessments. So if there are invasive species in upstream watersheds of the Delta that could come down, um, or if they're on the Division of Boating and Waterways watch list, for example, then we can ask for a proactive risk assessment so that that permitting step is done once that species is detected. And then treatment can start right away. 
Um, I want to note that it there is a better risk assessment process than previously existed. However, with every single month that is happening post detection, that species is likely spreading and making treatment harder and harder. So if there are, so I, I guess there is a point to all this that we tried this. We just in the last six months, I'm not remembering the date, submitted to Department of Fish and Wildlife a request to, um, to conduct a risk assessment of water lettuce, which is a species that has been observed um, previously in stream, upstream, upstream of the Delta. Um, and just to do that, uh, assess whether it warrants treatment if it is seen and, and noted in the Delta, um, but are the response we received is that there just simply isn't capacity to do the risk assessment. So, and while I, and I completely understand that capacity is a major issue. Um, so I, I, I respect that response, um, but just wanna note for this group that that's relatively low hanging fruit that we could be ready to treat some of the species that are most likely to invade simply because they're observed upstream in the watershed. Um, when they arrive, uh, just as it takes that a capacity uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife to, to be able to do that proactive work. So that's another piece that would be one little link in the chain of an early detection rapid response that we have the capability to do. Mm. And nobody had said anything. So one thing that came out of the But it is does that not that is something that the um voting waterways has, right? Yes. That you a reporting line, but maybe it's not so being like used. So there isn't necessarily one a one-stop shop that I'm aware of of where you would go for such a thing. There's the CDFA, not just weed list, you yeah. reach out to those folks, there's water waterways, mm -hmm. there's whatever land and water managers you have on there. Like for the ribbon weed where we found it, uh, we were working with CDFW and USDA to identify it. We're quite sure what it was. And we didn't want to go out there and make a declaration until we knew what it was, what we could do about it. Uh, before we can go. And some of these things, unfortunately, take a little bit of time to make a determination because the like, so CDFW identified it and said, oh, please, we better double check this to make sure this is right. So, but same thing, because we, we our partner gets a lot of questions. Hey, I've got this weed problem mm -hmm. through my contact. And there are a lot of different people. There isn't, unfortunately, a very clear answer. Um, we've got these different state agencies that have been working. Yeah, there's parts of the ecologic and uh, the interagency ecological program. So we could reach out to one of them. But in most cases, if it's an, uh, a weed challenge, you see the FA is generally a pretty good stop for starters. Mm -hmm. Other folks might reach out to again land managers, county environmental departments, uh, agricultural commissioners, folks of that sort too. Just responding to that too, um, I was picturing this person or, or group as like not just receiving information, but also like kind of regularly updating. Maybe have to mention WP, but just providing that information. Like, hey, like, we've repeated this already, but I don't know, still got this there. Um, because people have never looked for it. They, like, I know for us, one thing that was an issue species identification you didn't know the species mm -hmm. existed, and you were mis it. And then after a while, you're like, it really was strange. <laughs> Somebody, <laughs> you know, then you get to your team and can't be caught in that. Right. It really is. Sure. Yeah. So I want a quick question, Campbell Ingram, Delta Conservancy. Um, at our last board meeting, Rachel gave a presentation on the DISC team, and one of our board members requested that we actually start to take this information out to public work groups in the Delta, because they're your eyes and ears. Those are the people that are out there. If they recognize these invasives, they can report them early. But I'm, I'm curious if that's helpful based on everything I'm hearing. You know, that goes into an awareness of where they are in a system that lacks the permitting and the resources 
and the funding to be able to, ad to address the problem. So I'm, I'm assuming it's still beneficial to know where they are and have people identifying where these species are. It also creates kind of public, public not, you know, not, not the right term, but sort of a nuisance where you're creating an expectation of treatment from the people who are reporting mm -hmm. that you might not be able to live up to. I'm not sure there's a question there, but I'd be interested in your thoughts. Well, I, you know, I, I, I can start. Jeff Cottle, California State Parks. Uh, we've been working on an app to be able to engage citizen science. And the education that we try to provide through water invasive species outreach programs, workshops, or communications on our emails and such um, helps folks if they identify a problem. We used to go from, you can't get this water high, so you my water break. You look at the picture, it's anything but. <laughs> right? It might not even be a face. To them, they knew water hyacinth. That was their go-to, and that got us out there. To over the years, they have started to better identify what, like, what the plant is, at least. Uh, and we think that that is a, a really good start. But having folks work with us is important because we know where the issues are. We can work back with them, report back to them, because they're clearly engaged. And that engagement is very important for us because we find that some of these partners, that are some of these folks, we had landowners, members of the public, when we start to work with them, then maybe we can start to get certain uh, information from them, land access if that would be needed, if that's something that would require to get into some of these areas. Uh, but also sometimes they can show up to support us in various workshops and the public outings that we attend. Just a quick point of information, Rachel Wigginton, to Delta Conservancy. Campbell mentioned the DISC, which is the Delta Interagency Invasive Species Coordination Team, which is one of the interagency groups that meets in the Delta region to talk about invasive species. Um, and then also the Aquatic Veg Project Work Team, the PWT was mentioned, and that's under the IEP. Great. Well, thanks um, for those thoughts thus far. Um, so would like to open it up to the group if um, folks have any uh, responses to these particular prompts um, or any other questions on the topic um, for folks in the room. And if you uh, aren't seated around the central table uh, and you would like to ask a question, um, if you could please stand. Hi, Sarai Cohen, EPA. Um, I'm just wondering for the panel or anyone else here, are there flexibilities in the permitting that you've seen that have been effective so far that you would like to either expand or explore more? Nope, I can start. <laughs> about El California State Parks. Um, I, the flexibilities that we've found had to be self-created. So I've spent uh, many years in industry working with, say, federal EPA or federal FDA, most of the processes are pretty straightforward, uh, transparent, and it's easier to work with the regulatory agencies to kind of figure out, this is where I want to go, how do I get there? I found when it comes to something as challenging as managing the, uh, as the endangered species and whether you think it's, you're going to help it or, or you know, see it decline further, is that these processes change very frequently. Every year when we go back and talk to U.S. Fish, the status of the Delta smell will change, and it's not usually in a positive fashion. And so in working with them as our partner, things may become more restricted. But one of the things we built into our program as part of our Section 7 formal consultation process is this demonstration investigation zone, where we said there's all these tools we'd love to use, but since we haven't used them before, and because there may be concern about them for our initial effects analysis, we want to test it first, have a conversation, and then move forward. So the benefit of that is we are using tools now, or we were able to test tools that originally we probably would have gotten some pushback from, or mitigation or conservation measures that would be much improved their non-use to a point where they can be used in limited capacity. When it comes to the restoration that we're, the sites that we're talking about today, we don't have funding for research or science. Without that, it would be very challenging for us to take these tools into the sites because that's where the endangered species that these agencies are protecting are. And so, with further research, we would probably be able to move forward with that. But this DIS approach has gained some flexibility that we previously didn't even know existed because this kind of every year ongoing conversation 
where if we can request a little more of something, provided our effects analysis is not going to change, and the status of the species is not going to, to further be jeopardized. So that's one of the things that we have seen in terms of kind of flexibility and what seems to be a pretty rigid regulatory landscape. Like to add to that, Gina Darren DWR. We, uh, I would like to see so more flexibility in who can do the work under these permits. We've been talking about this uh, sort of for a while. The boating water race has done a lot of work to get a lot of permits. You saw the the Trivial Pursuit wheel that's so yeah. Um, and well, now that Bo boating water race has all the permits and maybe they are now have they have limited capacity due to their budget or other reasons other agencies who maybe have more capacity and staff resources if we could apply and do the work under their permits in the the same like geographic scope that they have and we're reporting up and so it's not an additional herbicide load but we're you know in all of their terms and conditions, we're operating and we're in communication and we're doing all the monitoring. I would love to see more flexibility on the, the agencies that are successful in getting these permits to be able to share the permission to do the work with other agencies who have a similar mission. Can I ask a follow up to that? That would help us now, right? That oh, that would help us. Yes. Yeah. Charlotte, on your, sorry, did I know? Uh, you have a hand yeah. here. Sorry to jump in, but yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Anna Cramper, no fisheries, so really appreciate hearing, you know, where our, <clears throat> excuse me, existing consultations, you know, allow for successes here and, and understanding, um, really appreciate, you know, both the demonstration investigation zones, right, because our, our biological opinions are often leaning on best available information and best available science to look at potential impacts to our species. So the more information that we have regarding a potential effect of an application, um, the more comfortable we are in sort of permitting that activity moving forward. So, um, but also understanding you don't have all the time and resources and folks to be able to carry that out. So um, appreciate the suggestion looking in terms of flexibility, uh, sort of utilizing existing coverage, but bringing on partner agencies to assist with um, the efforts I, you know, on the surface, I think that would be something we would be happy to talk about and, and look for flexibility to work into, you know, that um, understanding that resources are limited and, and you know, this is uh, a, a beneficial action overall moving forward. Um, I also wanted to mention um, very much the majority of the, you know, invasive aquatic uh, control is through boating and waterways, section seven consultation. But I did want to mention, we, we do view the action and the activity um, as a restoration activity. We do have a programmatic section seven consultation for restoration activities that spans valley wide. And that's um, really a consultation that's intended to provide efficiencies for good projects, good restoration projects. Um, usually it is um, a little bit more of a straightforward application process, doesn't require our full consultation timeline associated with it. Uh, and one of the actions that qualifies for inclusion under that restoration programmatic opinion is applied invasive species control. So, um, of course, as um, goes with those type of consultations. There are a number of side boards to ensure that those overall impacts are minimized, right? So um, it may not allow you to test novel techniques because, you know, we're, we're leaning on, um, you know, techniques that we do have information on the impacts of. So there will be some constraints in terms of side boards there, but it's yet another opportunity for other agencies interested in restoration to find some efficiencies and tap into the potential for aquatic um, invasive species control as part of the restoration project. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I have one more thing to add, if, I, if there's time, just checking. Okay, so um, while we're on the topic of permitting, I think um, it, one of the things that for many permits for, for actions that an implementing entity is taking, often models are used to evaluate the impacts. And I think this is an area where we could stand to grow um, if, with respect to invasive aquatic vegetation control. So we kind of mentioned and you heard a lot about the complexity of this issue. Gina even mentioned, well, there could be even benefits of Phragmites. Um, and and we, we need a lot of more, we probably need 
more research to be able to do this, but there have already been some initial efforts to develop bioeconomic models that can evaluate the, um, given what we know about species growth, survival, habitat use um, for plants, where and, and the efficacy of the tools that we have, you can make an evaluation of how likely you are to affect an impact on the species that you're trying to control. And then um, if we have knowledge on what the toxicity of any given tool is to a, a species that we're trying to protect, um, we, we could, scientists could develop models for evaluating the trade-offs. So trade-offs of having the aquatic vegetation in place, not treating it, what's the impact on the species because there are negative impacts versus the, um, the, the investing in the tool and developing it, having a reducing coverage if, if we can achieve that. And then what's the benefit for the species? So you could kind of hope that's helpful for, for showing how there might be possibilities for developing these models that then could be used in a permitting context to determine what's appropriate. There's a lot of information that's needed to populate the models like those, and that's where we need more investment. But um, that would mirror other approaches that we have that permitting agencies and implementing agencies consult on and use tools to predict outcomes of the actions they're thinking of permitting. So we, we're not quite there yet, but there have been some initial efforts and we just need to continue to support them. Louise. Yep. Um, so I would like to open it up um, if there are any um, folks online who would like to um, raise their hand or put a question in the chat. Um, now would be a good time. We're getting towards the end of this agenda item. But we'll give folks just a moment there. Do we, do we have anything, Eric? Yes, sir. Okay. Great. Um, then I'd also uh, like to um, formally call for public comment on this agenda item from either anyone in the room or online. A um, little bit of background too, I'm not sure how much we contextualize, but um, because uh, we are a medically keen body here, this is why we have the, the formal process of, you know, we're, we're having a conversation, we're doing questions, but we also are asking for formal public comment to uh, follow those guidelines. So in case that wasn't clear, <laughs> you're wondering why I was doing that. Do we have any public comment? No public comment. There is one, uh, Doug Johnson. You can speak. Hi, thanks. Doug Johnson, uh, Executive Director of the California Invasive Plant Council. It's great to hear all this coordination um, going on. I wish it was um, that way everywhere on invasive plant issues. My question is, um, and this may be in part my ignorance of how the um, how aquatic weed management happens across the state, but um, it was mentioned earlier about uh, weeds upstream uh, and trying to get ahead of those that, you know, things that could flow down into the delta. Um, and I guess my question is, what is the um, existing coordination between uh, work that happens on invasive uh, aquatic vegetation in the delta um, and work that happens on invasive aquatic vegetation elsewhere in the state, um, in particular in places that can flow into the delta, but also places that don't flow into the Delta. Thank you, Doug, for the question. So Jeffrey Cardell, California State Parks. Uh, you know, we have worked with CD and CDFA, and we've been a part of this project work team. We have the aquatic weed project work team that we mentioned earlier that meets right now, actually, uh, in terms of some communication with that. There was, an, there, there was a time where uh, someone from CDFA had identified alligator weed for us, uh, literally not three blocks away from one of our offices uh, with their badge saying, this is alligator weed, you should be aware of it. So we do have some notifications when aquatic weeds might enter into the Delta. Uh, in terms of that, there's knowledge sharing a couple times a year at this Project 14, uh, and if any you know, major issues may arise. But uh, and that's, what, that's kind of what I'm aware of. There, there used, we used to have a lot of involvement with weed management areas. And I, I think that those have probably been under-resourced and haven't been able to do much more than maybe have some communications instead of some formal meetings. And, and that's what I'm aware of in terms of uh, communication between, say, our agency, which has a limited geographical area from uh, the I Street Bridge in Sacramento down to the Bryant Dam and out to Cache Street Complex right now. 
uh, versus, say, CDFA or other agencies that may have a jurisdiction outside. Oh, I'll add to that. So the California Invasive Species Advisory Committee has recently funded, uh, refunded the statewide aquatic invasive species survey effort. This used to happen by out of CDFA's shop. Uh, they were looking for hydrilla, but they would note other things that they were finding um, all over the state. 2015, the budget was cut and those surveys stopped and it wasn't until recently. And they're going to hopefully start up again this year is they're going to start looking upstream. And so at least that, Doug, will give us a idea of what's out there. <laughs> as far as managing it, it will be up to the counties, the ag commissioners, and hopefully uh, the weed management area program has also been reinvigorated. Thank you, California Basin Plant Council for advocating for that. Uh, so hopefully with those groups back online, uh, there will be a lot more eyes looking out and communication with the ad commissioners. And those are the folks who can hopefully uh, make some things happen for us. But yeah, right now our hands are tied. We're just watching it all flow down. I, I work with the, the Oroville Field Division of DWR and they have alligator weed right underneath the Oroville Dam. And they're just watching it expand and flow back down to us in the Delta. There's really nothing we can do. And I, I will also note Dylan Chapel, um, and I'm forgetting what the acronym stands for, but I know that there is a meeting in April that this group will be presenting. Yeah, this, yeah. Yep. so so um, maybe just mention that um, as an additional opportunity to share this work outside of um, yes. this group. So that's the California Invasive Species Advisory Committee, Rachel Ligon. Acronym. To the Invasive Species <laughs> Council of California, ISCC, which is chaired by the Secretary of Resources and the Secretary of Agriculture. Yeah, so this this team will be bringing this um, the same presentation to uh, the meeting of that group in April um, to, I think, again, sort of help expand that coordination. Should add an upstream bullet on the discussion topics. Yeah. <laughs> Rachel Wigginton, Delta Conservancy. One other thing I mentioned on this point, Doug, is that the um, last year the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service completed a Pacific Southwest Aquatic Invasive Species Horizon Scan, um, and of the like target high priority species in that report, only one of them was plant, and that was Mexican primrose willow, which is a Ludwigia species. Um, so you know that we do have some like studies and a few lists of watch like plants we're watching out for. I think that is one of the ways we're trying to do that coordination. Great, well, I, um, then I will go ahead and uh, thank our panel for this afternoon. We can move to our next agenda item. Um, and uh, yeah, really helpful getting these updates, thinking proactively about how we really join the best available science that's ongoing uh, with management out there on the ground. So um, thanks all in the room and online for your engagement on this. Um, and with that, uh, I will transition to our next agenda item. Um, and I will continue on as MC for this agenda item as well. So uh, I'll be sharing today um, uh, in collaboration with Rosemary Hartman, who um, is environmental program manager at the Department of Water Resources, uh, a recap of the Tidal Wetland Science Symposium. Um, and this is another example of taking data that is um, coming out of restoration projects, um, analyzing and synthesizing it um, to help improve outcomes. Um, so uh, November was a was a busy month for some of us. And uh, next you'll hear uh, from, from Rachel Wigginton about the um, Restoration Forum, which happened the day after this. But um, the Tidal Wetland Restoration Science Symposium was co-hosted by the Department of Water Resources and the State Water Contractors on November 1st, 2023. Um, I'm talking to you about it today because I served on the planning committee um, that, that uh, Rosie led. And so um, for this uh, event, we had over 230 participants and over 30 presenters across a wide range of topics related to the uh, developing science around tidal wetland restoration. The goals of this symposium were to provide a forum for wetland researchers and restoration managers to collaboratively discuss the state of the science, um, identify high priority science activities needed to support adaptive management of wetland restoration sites, um, and lastly, identify high priority adaptive management activities needed to maximize the effectiveness of wetland restoration. 
Um, briefly wanted to also draw some of the connections between this effort um, and the Delta plan uh, and, and the DPIC. So um, as, uh, as, as many of you likely remember, um, the impetus for forming this restoration subcommittee um, was the amendment to chapter four of the Delta plan. Um, this includes an ecosystem restoration target of uh, 32,500 acres of tidal wetland restoration by 2050 over a 2007 baseline. And so understanding the science of these projects as they develop is going to be really critical um, as we continue to scale up towards meeting this larger scale goal. Um, of course, as we've already discussed today, um, adaptive management is a key aspect of this. It's also required by the Delta plan um, and requires extensive data um, collection, analysis, synthesis, and communication. Um, and specifically, uh, this symposium relates to the DPIC Restoration Subcommittee Work Plan actions um, listed below. So the first being survey current agency and restoration practitioner processes used to collect post-project data and perform post-project maintenance and management. So the work you'll hear about today um, is a prime example of that in the system. Um, and then identify mechanisms for evaluating the effectiveness of restoration and opportunities for better implementing long-term adaptive management, monitoring, and synthesis. So that's why we are bringing this agenda item to you today. Um, and so this um, symposium built on a previous symposium that happened just about 10 years ago uh, that was entitled Tidal Marshes and Native Fishes in the Delta. Will Restoration Make a Difference? So you might be able to tell from this title, this symposium happened before there had been a considerable amount of tidal wetland restoration in the system. Um, and it helped lay out some of the existing science um, and some of the expectations um, that uh, scientists and managers had for restoration at the time. And so um, since then, and particularly since 2018, we've greatly accelerated the pace of restoration in the system to the extent that these projects are now providing data um, that really allows us to help understand how they're evolving in these very early stages of their development. Um, and there's, there's this pressing need out here to help inform future restoration site monitoring, um, outstanding scientific studies that we'll need to um, address key questions, uh, adaptive management activities, and then how to fund and prioritize this list. Um, and so what we really, you know, tackled at the symposium was given restoration and science progress, what is the current state of the science? And where are the information gaps? And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Rosemary Hartman to walk us through um, a little bit of what we heard. Thanks, Dylan. Yeah, so during the symposium, we really covered all aspects of wetland restoration science. And uh, we're following up a, with a sort of summary paper describing what happened at the symposium and highlighting some of those key uh, uncertainties. And in that process, we've kind of created a uh, tabletop board game, if you will, for how restoration happens uh, in the Delta. And all of those green circles are the particular scientific inputs that go into making a restoration site. And so in the symposium, we touched on most of these aspects from the conceptual model of why we think restoration is a good idea that we um, have before the restoration mandator uh, instigating um, regulation. Once we have that mandate, there's the process of trying to find an available site, real estate research and contracting. And here we use that conceptual model to kind of guide where we're looking for our restoration site, interfacing with regulatory agencies along the way. Where the science really starts picking up is in that design alternatives phase where you have hydrodynamic modeling, you have maybe productivity modeling, you have literature, literature review of what has worked on other restoration sites. You have um, maybe even like fish life cycle modeling. How much potential production do you have? How might that help fish? Uh, and that's all interfaced with usually not only the internal restoration team, which is composed of scientists, engineers, um, contracting managers, et cetera, but also usually an external review team that is um, reviewing the science that you're doing, making adjustments, making advice, as well as going back to regulatory agencies. Is this what you want? Um, will this work? 
once we settle on a preferred design, um, there's some impact trade-off analysis along the way where you say, okay, yes, we could get these benefits to Delta smelt, but it might take away this much giant gar snake habitat, that kind of thing. The um, permitting bubble, which we have at the top there, is actually a place where a lot of that science is really synthesized, laid out in a way that is accessible to the public and the regulatory agencies, describe all of the potential impacts, um, get your Delta plan consistency. This is also the stage where a adaptive management and monitoring plan is produced in collaboration with uh, usually the interagency ecological program title wetlands monitoring project work team, as well as other teams of really leveraging the previous science that's been done. Um, and then after construction, we have effective just monitoring, which is different from just compliance monitoring. Not wanna only find out, well, did you build the site you said you would, but is the site actually functioning the way you expected it to? That's where the effect of this monitoring camp comes in, which is a lot of what we were really digging into in the symposium. And finally, once you have enough data from that effectiveness monitoring, closing that adaptive management loop, is there anything we should change? Uh, do we need to do more aquatic invasive species control? Do we need to um, potentially modify the site in any way? Uh, what if we learn for the next site? Next slide. So uh, this was a particularly good time to have this symposium because as Dylan mentioned, the pace of restoration has really picked up since the first of fish restoration program sites built in 2018. Um, and so this is just a map showing where we have tidal wetland restoration in the estuary right now or have planned in the next five to 10 years. The fish restoration program uh, is one of the most robust and largest restoration programs. They have a really good effectiveness monitoring program. And that is for the biological opinions on the State Water Project and Central Valley Project. Um, and that's 8,000 acres. There's also multi-benefit projects, such as those being built by the Delta Levies Program at Dutch Sloom, Harmic Williamson Tract, and others. The Healthy Rivers and Landscapes Program, um, which is the proposed volunteer agreements program for restoration, including many sites in the Delta. There's also some for-profit restoration like the Montezuma Wetlands uh, Project and uh, mitigation banks like the Liberty Island Conservation Bank. Next slide. So all those sites have been recently built or uh, are gonna be built in the next few years. But the real part of you know, science that we got into in the symposium is what have we learned from those? Um, and we learn through monitoring, right? Um, compliance monitoring is just showing that you built the site you said you would. Is it wet? Are there, is there vegetation there? Is it a wetland? Um, is there full tidal action? But the effect of this monitoring uh, is really where we learn, is the site producing productivity like we expected? Is it producing fish like we expected? Are fish using the site? Are there any negative impacts? Are we seeing weeds invade, et cetera? There's a lot of interagency planning and review of the monitoring program. Like I mentioned previously, we have the interagency ecological program titled Wetlands Product Work Team that is a great resource for sharing um, input onto monitoring plans and output um, when monitoring has been uh, conducted for a while. In the fish restoration program in particular, they take a before after control impact uh, technique for monitoring. So not only are they monitoring the site after the restoration, if relevant, they'll monitor before the restoration. Um, so many of these sites were managed wetlands or um, had some water on them. So they'll take information before the site is built, also uh, before information on the external uh, channels ne next to the future site, if it's not actually wet. And then the control impact uh, side of things is they will also be monitoring nearby tidal wetlands that are already established. Um, and this gives you a, a baseline of what does the tidal wetland in the estuary normally do so that if we see big increases in fish or decreases in fish, we can tell, okay, is this because we restored the site or is this just because it was a really wet year or something like that. Next slide. 
Um, and so we already have some preliminary results, which is really exciting. And this is where we really dug in in the symposium and nerded out a little bit, honestly. A lot of this isn't published yet, uh, very preliminary, but that was why the symposium was such a great, lively time to collaborate and to get information and to revise our conceptual model of how things work. Got to share some of this early um, results from our monitoring. Invertebrate productivity at some of these restoration sites is the same as, if not greater than, um, nearby wetlands. So they are starting to reach the same level as other wetlands in terms of invertebrates. Um, some evidence shows that during certain times of the day and times of the year, they act as temperature refuges. Um, we all know that climate change is increasing water temperatures in the Delta and uh, fish need some place to go or it's not too hot. Um, and wetlands with their vegetation and um, expansive shallows uh, at night, fish can find cool water refuges. And salmon and smelts have been found in a lot of these tidal wetlands. So early days, but some very promising results. Um, next slide. So um, we found a lot of promising results that we talked about at the symposium, but the real meat of the work that we did that day was on what do we not know? Um, we had some great breakout groups where all of the wetland scientists and managers got together and said, okay, what do we still need to know in order to manage these sites better? Some of the major things were thresholds for action. So we can go out there and monitor the site and say, okay, there's this much zooplankton, there's this many fish, there's this much aquatic weeds. But you know, as was mentioned earlier, when do we say, okay, this is too much aquatic weeds, we need to do something about it. And when is it like, well, we're gonna get some of that and it's not worth the cost of you know, spreading a bunch of herbicide on here, cost to the fish, not necessarily monetary cost. Um, and okay, you know, maybe our number of invertebrates is a little lower than the nearby wetlands, but is that too low for fish? And how long will it take for us to know whether or not we've crossed a threshold or not? Um, so definitely need to develop some thresholds for action and uh, clear actions that we can take on these sites. Also production rates and movement of that production. We have a lot of information on how much is there right now? How many fish are there? How many bugs are there? But are they growing? Um, do we find a lot of uh, invertebrates on the site just because they're you know, reproducing like crazy and going nuts? Or is it because no fish are there to eat them and so there's lots of them? Um, and then what are the fish doing while they're on the wetlands? You see they're there. Are they breeding? Are they finding food? Are they finding refuge from predators? Um, are they actually using it more productively than they would other habitats? Um, invasive vegetation control, we just had a whole action item on that one. Uh, and then how long do we have to monitor? Many times there's a lot of studies showing that it can take decades for restoration sites to reach um, similar levels to sites that were natural. So uh, if we don't see a fish colonizing them in five years, well, do we just have to wait longer or should we take some sort of action now? Next slide. Uh, so the other really uh, highlight of the symposium was talking about the communication and collaboration that can happen around tidal wetland science. It was something that we didn't go in with this being a major theme or a major goal we want to accomplish was talking about communication, but during the symposium, we kept highlighting the importance of communication between the regulatory agencies, the scientists, and the restoration practitioners, um, making sure that science is communicated on all levels and questions uh, and unknowns are communicated on all levels. We have a lot of really great forums and making sure that people know about the forums for communication and attend regularly uh, will really help improve um, the outcomes of wetland restoration and wetland science. And that's one reason why we put together, uh, we are putting together the follow-up paper after the symposium is really highlight some of these forums and reach a wider audience who might only be able to attend. With that, I'll give it back to the Ellen. Thank you, Rosie. Um, wanted to just kind of conclude the presentation by also highlighting some of the insights. Um, uh, so I 
by and large, we are very focused on um, fish and the aquatic food web here. But, um, you know, as Rosie mentioned, there are other projects in the system beyond those that are really focused on fish. Um, and so we had um, some of the project team from the Dutch Slough Restoration Project, which is led by the Department of Water Resources, um, uh, present as well about some of their early findings, as well as um, some of their adaptive management. And, um, you know, they're finding some really exciting things sort of on more of the terrestrial end, as well as on the greenhouse gas end. So um, there's a team from UC Berkeley um, that is funded through a Delta Science Program um, Research Award. Uh, and they have been looking at the flux of greenhouse gases at the site. Um, and they are part of the global network that monitors in standardized ways across sites, uh, yeah, sites across the entire globe. And what they're finding at Dutch SLU, um, and you can see this sort of in the blue line there at the bottom, where anything below the zero point, the dashed line, is uptake of carbon. What they're finding is that of all the sites that they measure um, uh, across the planet, Dutch SLU is in the top 1% of carbon sequestration rates. Um, which is a pretty remarkable finding. Um, and so, you know, this is an indication that um, this is the main freshwater tidal wetland um, restoration site that's currently being monitored for greenhouse gas exchange. This might be another promising direction for us to start um, pursuing uh, at a wider variety of sites to help see, is this, is this an anomaly? Is this something that we can generalize over sites? Um, the team has also been finding, there's a team from UC Davis um, out there that works across sites that are associated with the Department of Water Resources Delta Levies program to monitor terrestrial biodiversity. Um, and they found that even though Dutch SLU is one of the youngest sites in the network, it actually has the highest terrestrial biodiversity of any, um, any of those sites. And so again, while we think a lot about fish in the system, the benefits of these projects really go far beyond much broader swath of the food web. Um, and I think, you know, Rosie already spoke very well to this importance of first long-term data, um, uh, research partnerships and regular coordination. And so these are all themes that also go for these sort of um, other items at the Dutch SLU site. Um, so these are a list here um, of the draft management priorities that, are, that we're currently identifying as part of the paper that Rosie um, mentioned uh, um, that, the, that the planning team is working on. And so these are the things that we're closely thinking about. Again, these are in draft form, so they're certainly subject to change, but um, we're honing in on ensuring that models used in design are validated, expanded, and updated for future use. As you know, many of you know, once you actually put a plan on the ground, um, it's very important to make sure that it's behaving as you expect it to behave. Um, incorporating experimental design and opportunities for adaptive management into restoration planning. So um, actually making sure that experiments are built into restoration from the beginning, um, which has been incorporated uh, across some projects, but we feel it could certainly be expanded to help us identify some of these key questions. Um, clearly defining the adaptive management timeframes for various performance metrics identifying pathways to take corrective actions on existing sites when the site is past an ecological threshold, investing in monitoring realized function to inform adaptive management, and connecting the outcome of scientific studies to long-term management plans for restoration projects to increase resiliency to future change. Um, so, you know, there's obviously a lot of thematic overlap between um, what we're talking about at this symposium and the previous agenda item on aquatic vegetation, given how critical that is. And so um, we are also working with the team from the Department of Voting and Waterways on this follow-up paper as well. So there's the built-in um, nexus between those, those different items. Um, so uh, in addition to the plan, in addition to the paper that the planning team is working on, um, we are also synthesizing participant feedback uh, on high priority science activities um, to help sort of drive some of uh, the development of that work um, and identifying high priority adaptive management activities for current and future projects. Um, so exciting step forward and we're looking forward to uh, continually revisiting um, this, uh, this issue as the sites develop. Um, because a lot, a lot will change in coming years with a variety of impacts as well as the sites themselves. So, um, with that, uh, I'd like to open it up first to folks in the room 
and uh, and we'll, we'll move to folks online uh, if you have any questions. So if you have any questions here in the room, feel free to raise your hand. Yes, you can see. Sarah Lesmeister, Delta Conservancy. Um, so I am a big fan, as you guys, maybe you guys know, of environmental monitoring or effective risk monitoring, but also um, a big proponent of just getting restoration projects in the ground. So what I'm struggling with as an agency or department that does a lot of funding for restoration projects in the Delta is how to balance funding effectiveness monitoring for, let's say, months, years, decades, versus just putting in additional restoration projects in the Delta, I'm trying to find that right balance. So I guess my question to the panel and members of the room is, um, how do you balance that? How do you balance doing, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars of effectiveness monitoring versus, you know, adding hundreds of thousands of acres of traditional restoration? Um, it's tough. You know, we want both, <laughs> of course, all the time. Um, I think it, there is the, you know, while it feels like, okay, I'm spending this money on monitoring, which is I can't get the next site in the ground. However, if you get the next site in the ground before you have data from the first site, you might not be able to do as effective a, a site. Um, but I definitely don't want to be the one to say, we need more science before we can do anything. Um, I'm not going to give you an answer as to which to prioritize uh, because I'm wearing my official hat, but um, it's a tough question. Well, and I think one of the things, uh, yeah, I completely agree um, with both, you know, both the question and Rosie's response. And I think one of the things that really came out of this symposium was also the, the ability to build on findings from other projects. So, um, First of all, you know, the fact that the fish restoration program, for example, uh, first of all, just developed the protocols to begin with. <laughs> and um, Rosie had a big part of that in her previous role. So big, big credit for that development, um, as well as Stacey Sherman and her team um, at CDFW really digging in on that um, development and implementation. So that project has funding. And so I think that working to first look to um, look to existing methodologies that have already been thoroughly vetted through other programs is actually a huge cost savings if you think about it. And so I think in a lot of ways, being able to point project proponents say, hey, you might not be able to monitor everything, but when you're making that decision, make sure that you are coordinated with other efforts because they've actually done a lot of this already. Um, and then second, you know, um, sort of the, uh, the Dutch slew case, case study example where we now sort of have this um, this suite of projects, you know, Dutch Lee doing a lot more terrestrial monitoring, fish restoration program sites doing more aquatic monitoring. Also just making sure that these communication lines are open. Um, and, you know, some of us who spend a lot of time coordinating say, wow, we do a lot of coordination and communication. Um, but I think we all agree that it's super important for us to be learning these things and learning from each other, identifying those opportunities to take the data that's been learned and say, okay, well, we know now that, for example, you know, when we when we open a site, we expect X to happen, and that can help support projects that might not have as much money for monitoring to help identify a what they can reasonably expect, but b um, also like what gaps they might need to particularly focus on. And so, think through coordination. We can help kind of um, get to a place where we're acknowledging that there's you know relative to what we could be funding, there's always going to be research caps, as much research as, you know, we do a lot of research in the system. <laughs> and there's still, you know, there's a lot of money going into that. Um, so focusing on co-learning, learning from each other, um, and, you know, reconciling uncertainties uh, that allow us to move forward. Um, and lastly, just post hoc um, monitoring, um, even if it's not perfect, it can go a long way. And this comparison to reference sites, I think, is also a critical part that helps you get potentially more bang for your buck so the other thing i wanted to build on that is um even the fish restoration program is finding like you can't necessarily monitor everything everywhere all the time at the level that would be ideal so you know some things like maybe you do a really intensive study of the fish on 
one site this year and next year we intensively study the fish on a different site and just kind of do a minimum on one site and spread your resources around a little so you're learning from something but aren't burning billions of dollars getting all of the data everywhere as much as I would like that. <laughs> um, so Dan Alice, can you stand up? Sorry. Um, so this is actually an idea that I've been thinking about a lot uh, in the fish restoration program. So um, I think one way that you could achieve that is by rather than looking at every site for everything, which kind of is impossible financially and just resource wise, we don't need to have people to do that. If you were to hone in on five or six really well selected sites and then team up with the other agencies that are funding that kind of research, the total wouldn't actually be that bad. It would be that the sources for that funding are difficult to find because you need a big chunk of cash, whereas a lot of the ways to get money are, are limited in scope. So that's how I think it. Thank you. Um, any other questions in the room? Hi, uh, Jamie Silva, Massive Valley of the Fiction Board. Uh, we talk a lot about effectivist monitoring and about these restored sites. You know, given the pace of restoration within the Delta post effective monitoring, how is it that we can adequately fund agencies or local nonprofits or non governmental agencies to effectively manage these? One of the examples that um, came up from the symposium came from the uh, DWR team that is working on Dutch SLU. And what they have um, started to develop is a land stewardship program within the department. Um, I won't go into detail because um, while I coordinate with them, I am not, you know, <laughs> not involved with the day to day of that. But I think that identifying those needs and gaps, first of all, and then identifying ongoing funding to really support staff as well as collaborators to do that has been a really effective model um, at Dutch SLU, has really allowed us to, to generate this. Um, and then also, you know, collaborative funding. So for example, again, um, the Delta Stewardship Council on the Science Program has funded that research on greenhouse gas. So pulling from different funding sources to help fill some of those special study gaps and needs, um, I think is one, one piece of that, uh, but, you know, also just really underscoring the importance um, uh, of as you're communicating with folks, even if they're not sold, just continue to say this this long term data is so crucial for us. Um, funding is really a issue, Rosemary Hartman, Water Resources, um, because there are a lot of funding opportunities that limit the ability to fund long term management. It'll be you know a call for two or three year projects that can fund science, or a call for you know restoration implementation that specifically will say this cannot cover long-term monitoring. Um, and there aren't a lot of grant opportunities available that will fund, you know, a five or 10 year monitoring program. Um, so I don't know, not being someone who is in charge of setting up grants, I'm not exactly sure how that gets solved, but uh, it's something that would make life a lot easier for some of like the NGOs or programs that don't have um, monitoring written into their mandate that forces agencies to pay for it. So Dan, I'll see if I got to keep this. So this, I kind of think actually would apply here too. If you, this might not work depending on the, the variable that you're looking at. But if you were to do uh, a two-year study, but then wait five years, do it again, wait five years, do it again, obviously that doesn't have a funding structure. But if you sort of had selected those sites that you wanted to focus on, you, you studied them intensively for that short duration, and then you repeated that study, you might be able to pull that off and get the longer-term perspective without like a straight 10-year funding, which, yeah, I've never heard of that. I can add a little bit to that. Um, Charlotte Biggs is um, the Department of Water Resources. So yeah, we are um, establishing a land stewardship program and that's DWR wide. 
with all of our programs that um, own or, or maintain the Andrew Hood. Um, and that'll be officially on our org chart in July, um, but we sort of kicked that off now. And I guess funding is always gonna be, I think, a challenge, and especially right now. But the, all I really can say is just for our projects, we're just trying to plan that in, in the beginning. And so getting funding for long-term monitoring, maintenance, all that, um, in the early stages of project planning. It's difficult because we don't always know all the constraints and so we have to make a lot of assumptions, but just sort of trying to tackle that as part of our project implementation costs and making that clear when we're um, requesting funding that that's part of the project costs. Like it's not just building, it's just the adaptive management. So that's, I guess, a short answer of how we're at least trying to approach it and not um, kick the can or have it be something we need to try and find funding for later. I think, you know, that level of funding will probably be, you know, you can always supplement and do more um, monitoring. So we'll always be looking for those topics. Um, and we're, we're a little bit over on this agenda item, so I'm just gonna move us on to our online um, questions. Uh, so if anyone does have a, a brief question, please uh, feel free to raise your hand or put it in. Currently there. Great. Um, so then I will uh, formally request public comment on this item before we move on. Just a moment. There is no public comment. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, excellent. So thank you very much, Rosie. And we will move on to our next agenda item. Uh, I will hand it over now to Rachel Wigginton from Delta Conservancy. Need our final edit. Do a little shuffle here so you can see me better on the camera. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, as Dylan said. And as I said earlier, my name is Rachel Wigginton, I'm Senior Environmental Scientist for Delta Conservancy. And I'm excited to be here with you today recapping um, our second Delta Restoration Forum, which took place on November 2nd of 2023 at the Riot Hotel in Walnut Grove. So the Delta Restoration Forums are related to the Restoration Subcommittee's work plan, most specifically through Goal 1, Objective 2, which asks the subcommittee to convene a community forum to discuss current restoration efforts and community concerns. But our November forum had a few specific goals, which you see up here on the slide. Um, first, the planning team really aimed to craft an event where attendees could quickly gain information about a wide variety of restoration projects and, pro and programs that were happening across the Delta and Sassoon Marsh. And we also really wanted to encourage attendees at the forum to network so that folks could meet and start creating these sort of cross-sectoral relationships that, as I think has been emphasized in the first two agenda items, like those sorts of communications are really valuable and pretty critical for getting restoration work done. And these goals came out of our efforts to build on the first Delta Restoration Forum, which took place in February of 2023 at the Delta Conservancy's office in West Sacramento. And we gave a report out about that February forum and its outcomes to this subcommittee at our March 2023 meeting, and also to the full DPIC at the April 2023 DPIC gathering. So based on feedback from the February forum, we learned that what attendees wanted with a stronger focus on different restoration projects and programs that were happening and less time dedicated to really formal presentations. So at the first forum, we did spend a significant amount of time doing things like you know, overviewing the purpose of the forum series, discussing the amendment to chapter four of the Delta plan, and also talking about like restoration progress that has happened in the region. So attendees at the February forum really wanted a chance just to dig in more about specific projects. And they also asked that they we consider a location that was more central within the Delta for the next forum. So in response to this feedback from the February forum, in November, we hosted our second forum at the historic Riot Hotel, which is in Walnut Grove in the heart of the Delta. And the planning team also organized this event as an open house, so there were no formal presentations. Instead, attendees could come at any time during the course of the event and walk in and just have direct interactions with project and program proponents about restoration projects 
Um, and these presenters brought materials. Some of them were handouts and one pagers. Some of them were posters um, and things that you know, folks could actually learn from about these individual projects. The second forum had a lot of engagement, which we're really proud of. There were 67 attendees from numerous different sectors that are involved in or interested in restoration in the Delta and Sassoon Marsh. By far the largest sector that was represented by these attendees were state agencies um, with 20 different folks attending from different state agencies. But we also had attendance from a number of different groups aside from state workers including 15 individuals from nonprofit organizations and several attendees from federal agencies, consulting groups, small businesses, JPAs and RCDs, and the Delta community. And then we had individual representation from growers, academia, local government, tribal organizations, state legislature, and advocacy groups. So the success of this event was really in a large part thanks to the planning team who you see listed on the slides here. Um, Doug Brown from Douglas Environmental, Gilbert Cosio from River Delta Consulting, um, Sarah Medina from Restore the Delta, and Ivan Sinok from the Buena Vista Rancheria of Miwok Indians, in addition to staff from the Council and the Delta Conservancy. Um, and also a big shout out to Charnel Wycliffe, um, Emma um, Askin, uh, Eric, Erica, and Hope Miller from the Council and the Conservancy who really helped like support and facilitate the event. So over 20 projects and programs were represented at the November Forum. It was one of those things where we asked a whole lot of people and we were really um, encouraged and honestly surprised by how many people said, yes, definitely we'll be there. Um, so it was really well attended as far as the different types of projects and programs that were represented. Um, and the planning team really made an effort to reach out to present potential presenters from projects really across the gradient from projects that are still in the planning phase to projects that were in the phases of being implemented. And additionally, in a large part on advice from members of the planning team, we sought out presentations from programs that were more broadly focused, so not just have habitat restoration projects, um, but also habitat augmentation programs like the Nature Conservancy's Bird Returns Program, um, which had recently received funding from CVFW to implement widely in the Delta, um, and also environmental education groups like the Center for Land-Based Learning's Student Landowner Education and Watershed Stewardship Program. So it was a really wide variety of presentations um, and a good representation of what's going on in the Delta. Presenters brought materials to represent their projects or programs. So on the screen, you're gonna see two examples of those. Um, first on the left, we have a one pager, which describes the DWR restoration program on the lower Sacramento River. And on the right is a poster describing DWR's Lookout Slough restoration project. So there were lots of materials from all these 20 plus different presenters and staff put together a packet with abstracts describing each of the projects or programs that were represented at the forum. And this was posted online and shared through the council and conservancies listserv. And in addition, staff compiled all the materials presented at the forum into an online mural board, which is available upon request. And our goal with compiling this information was hopefully to allow folks that weren't able to attend in person in November to still have access to the information that was presented. And the different presenter contact information is also listed in that abstract book. So if an interested party were to reach out and look at that abstract book and get interested in a particular project or program, they would have a direct contact to learn more about that project or program. So after the November forum, we did send out a follow-up survey um, and 14 individuals that attended the forum responded to our survey. Um, and you can see some of the feedback quoted directly here on the screen. Um, we got a lot of really positive feedback from these 14 individuals. Um, and I think in general, most folks identify the value of an in-person networking event as being something that they really liked about the Restoration Forum. After several years of doing, you know, 
a lot of remote work and a lot of hybrid meetings, people really enjoy just getting together and being able to talk about what they're really passionate or interested about, which is restoration. Um, and they also indicated that having the event, the Ride Hotel, was a really great um, location. There was food and drink available for purchase from the hotel. Um, and it was, again, in the heart of the Delta. It's a little more central than our West Sacramento Delta Conservancy office. Feedback from attendees also indicated that while networking was really appreciated, um, they would have liked a little more structure. So at the first forum, we went a little too much, I think, with the stand-up talks. And at the second forum, it seems like we went a little too far in the other direction. Um, so we did have our abstract book available at like the sign-in table when folks came in, but there was a couple times when there was a whole lot of people waiting to get in line. And I don't know if everyone really saw that that was there. Um, the planning team had a debriefing meeting and we discussed, you know, if we were to put on a similar future event, maybe we would have an MC who would get up every once in a while and announce who was present or perhaps even, um, you know, people had asked for the potential of having short presentations um, to sort of orient people to everyone who was present at the meeting. Attendees also suggested that we continue to make an effort to engage the broader Delta community. Um, so while we did have more community members at the second forum, there was still, you know, not very many folks in attendance relative to state and agency workers. Um, and particularly, they were hoping we could engage the Delta community, landowners, growers, and farmers, and then tri tribal representatives were identified, of course, as a really important partner in this work that it would be good to engage through the restoration forums. So a lot of really good feedback in that survey, but encouragingly, 79% of the folks that responded to our survey said that they were very likely to attend a similar future event. And last, we also discussed the possibility of, um, or it was dis uh, discussed at our planning meeting, of tabling at community events. So instead of making these events where the community can come to us, perhaps we can explore going to them where they already are gathering. So for our future directions, a lot of this is reflecting um, some of the feedback that we got in that um, feedback survey. So. We really hope to continue to broaden involvement in the Restoration Forum series from community members, um, again, particularly the agricultural community, the tribal community, and also um, environmental justice groups. Um, we are considering the possibility of, so these first two Restoration Forums were, I think, kind of like a big tent, you know, everybody come to us in our one big tent, um, but perhaps we could have a more targeted set of meetings where we would be meeting with smaller groups, but really you know, going to, for example, growers and bringing them information that would be most particularly relevant and particularly meaningful to them, um, or bringing together a small group of interested tribal representatives and bringing to them the information that's most relevant and interesting to them. And again, we have this idea of tabling and we could potentially take this information to the community as opposed to asking the community or these community representatives to come to us. So that is the recap of what happened in November and where the planning committee has been thinking about our future directions. But now we're really interested in opening this up to discussion with the group. So the subcommittee and also the other attendees at the meeting today, um, we're really interested in getting some guidance from you all about what the future directions of the restoration forum series could look like. We have a few discussion questions up on the screen, but feel free to ask questions or even bring up points that are interesting to you um, from the information presented or that you would like to discuss. So first we'll just open it up to Q&A. Um, and if anybody in the room has a question or a comment, please offer it now. Campbell Ingram, Delta Conservancy. I think these forums are fantastic. Uh, obviously, it would be wonderful if, I think one of the main purposes really too, was to try to get the community to come in to be able to understand what's happening as far as restoration within their area, see what's planned, what's coming up, give them a chance to engage. We've tried a couple different methods now to make that happen and it hasn't been, they just, you know, they're, they're busy people. So 
I absolutely think we should continue it for all the benefits that we've realized through the first two. Um, I like the idea of doing more community events and trying to maybe table at events where we know there will be large groups of community members. The challenge there, I guess, is distilling everything we had in a whole room of 20 plus restoration of practitioners into a message at a table that's that can be you know helpful. But I think it's something we should continue to explore. I think it's, it's really valuable. Yeah. Well, thank you to both. Um, CDFA. Um, I'm not sure the exact structure of the forums beforehand, but especially to get community members to show up, um, I definitely encourage you to make it more accessible by maybe having some evening hours or like a weekend day. Um, so lots of, you know, a lot of those landowners are probably tending their land, but they might also have a day job and just kind of a state worker who prefer to, you know, like either, you know, during their regular business hours, but to have the community show up, we're going to want to make sure we expand those hours for them. Yeah, thank you so much for that comment. Um, so the first forum was sort of like straddled business and evening hours. And then the second forum was fully in the evening, but still on a weekday. So I think that potentially having a weekend that we choose to host a future forum could be an interesting way to see if we get more community engagement that way. Yeah. Hey, Jeff Henderson, Delta Stewardship Council. Just curious, the smaller, the, the earlier slide talked about potentially smaller groups. Are those those could be organized by topic, they could be organized by location. Just wondering if any thought, if, not wondering if any thought, just wondering what folks' opinions about that might be. Yeah, um, well, I can offer mine and then if anyone else has them, I think that um, location that you brought up is a really interesting one. That's something that definitely the planning team has discussed that like community members might be less interested in engaging like on the Delta as a whole and much more interested in engaging on particular projects that are happening near them. Um, so maybe having some sort of like sub regional focus, if we're really trying to bring in community members, I think that that could be a good suggestion. Um, I also think that just um, tailoring for specific interest groups, particularly. So we've gotten some feedback from other members of the planning team, um, thinking about you know, growers and farmers that, you know, some of the broader restoration topics might not be as interesting to them, but some of these like wildlife friendly farming, habitat augmentation programs, um, that that sort of information might be the most interesting to them. And then perhaps if, you know, there's other aspects of restoration more broadly that we really feel like we should be educating some of these particular groups about, you know, we can add that to the agenda as well. So we're really, you know, adding value to them and giving them the things that they care about and then also able to engage with them and get their feedback on these other topics that are of more broad um, importance or more broadly applied. I don't know if anyone else within the planning team here who has other thoughts or if other folks in the room have thoughts. Yeah, I'll just briefly mention uh, Dylan Chapel, the Stewardship Council, um, just the opportunity as well to work directly with groups that are already involved with various you know, groups, communities, uh, folks to help facilitate some of those conversations. So there's a little more of a link between the work we do um, and a trusted partner. Um, and so I think that's something that we've, we've talked about a bit in the context of this and, and are curious to explore yeah, that, uh, that potential. Uh, just in consideration of, of multi-benefit projects uh, planning, uh, maybe we could invite reclamation districts or flood control associations. You know, they may not be the first thing that you think of in terms of restoration practitioners, but if there is need of the Delta because we're running out of room to restore these things. Yeah, I think that's a Rachel Wiginton Delta Conservancy. I think it's an excellent point. I feel like through our Delta Conservancy Prop One grant program, we've worked with some RCDs on know, stream side, revegetation, those sorts of things. So yeah, I definitely agree. And we had a few RCDs that was sort of captured on that graphic under JPAs, but um, I, I don't feel like we've specifically reached out to them as an interest group in like a concerted way. So I think that's an excellent suggestion. Yes. 
to the goal CDFA. Um, and on another note, I'm just you know, through your contact, and again, I'm not sure how you necessarily advertise for the event previously, um, but making sure, you know, especially for the community members, like you know, the growers that you're reaching out to, like the local farm bureau, um, you know, start to getting a lot of their information there. And other places that might be to like get on their newsletter and send it out, like, hey, this thing's coming up. Um, and just maybe using flyers at various community centers in that area, especially if you're doing it for a more paper rapid suggestion. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Anything coming in online? Okay. Um, excellent. Well, thanks for that. Those bits of feedback. I am curious, um, just looking to our list of discussion questions, um, if the group or the subcommittee members um, feel like there is any, so I've heard some support for the idea of having these more targeted small group discussions. Um, and then I think Campbell said like continuing the restoration forums is the, you know, similar to the first two, um, but sort of curious to get feedback. Um, in November, we had this much more like open house style format. Like, is there um, a feeling from the group that that would be valuable to do again, either, um, you know, early in 2025 or late in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think there's value in kind of having it at a regular time. I believe there's a little of that connection. So people are kind of expecting it. I mean, the risk is that maybe you know how long restoration projects take and there may not necessarily be a lot of new things to share, but um, but I think still at least, especially as state agencies or federal agencies, I think still putting ourselves out there is a positive thing. And again, to, to still build um, connections and trust um, with, yeah. with locals to show up so when, when they're able to show up. Okay, great. Thanks, Rachel Wiggins and Delta Conservancy. I uh, so what I'm hearing is like support for continuing it, but also balancing that with like, you know, the partners that we're bringing in to do these presentations and making sure that they feel like they you know, continue to have capacity to present like new information to share. Excellent. Um, all right, then um, if any other questions in the room or online? General public? Oh, that's, yeah, so I'm gonna go next to the general public comment on this agenda item, is there anything? Okay, great. Um, well, at the risk of sounding redundant, but very much following procedure, uh, we are heading towards closing out our meeting. Um, and so uh, I would like to uh, formally ask for public comment on any items that weren't on their on the agenda, uh, but that are relevant to um, the subject matter jurisdiction of the Restoration Subcommittee. Folks, a moment. No public comment. Not seeing any public comment. Great. Well, with that, I'd um, like to thank you all for your time. Um, thank our panelists for their presentation and uh, uh, officially adjourn today's meeting. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.